Um, and let me share my screen. Okay. Um, so I'm going to minimize Discord for the moment, um, but I should hear it if you guys have questions or put something in the chat. It should give me a little uh, notification. Um, so yeah, I'm going to start with my project and then just add some scripts from scratch. So I don't actually really need anything like any images or anything from my assets folder for this, ex for this lab. Um, so I'm just going to go into my game and then open project.godot. And it says, how do you want to open this Godot file? I want to use Godot engine. I feel like, I don't know how to make that. This is like another Windows 11 thing. Like, how do I make it remember? If I say open with Godot engine, maybe that'll make it remember that that's what I want to do. Anyway, um, here's my uh, Godot setup. And uh, I'm going to go down to the file system and open up my default scene. And so here's my default scene. There's my little player. Um, and I already actually have a script that I've created for my player, but I'm just going to rewrite it. Um, so I'll go over how to do that. But before I do that, I want to make something called a global script. And a global script is basically what we use to keep track of certain values that we need in multiple scenes. Um, so I'm going to go over to the script tag tab and go over how to create a new script first, and then I'll explain the global script a little more. Um, so in the top of Godot, I have my, th my different areas. I have the 2D, 3D, and script. And so uh, I think we've seen this before, but this is my script editor. It's nice that it's built in, um, so I can write my scripts in here. Uh, and if I want to create a new script, I can just go to File and click New Script. And I want to make sure this is in my scripts folder. Um, so I'm going to click on the little folder uh, next to the path and go to scripts. And I want to name this. So I'm going to call this global uh, with a capital G. Um, it doesn't really matter that much what you name it, but that's what I usually call it. Um, and I'm going to, I'll go with the default template so you guys can see what that looks like, but I'm probably going to delete most of it. And so once I've got this set up, I'm going to click create. And so this is kind of a default script. And it actually kind of describes some stuff in here um, that I'm going to go over in a minute. Um, but this is kind of useful explanations of, of different things. So this is what our script looks like. Um, I'm actually going to delete this beginning, this part up to the beginning. Um, and then I, I'm going to make the text a little bit bigger. So I'm going to go to editor settings and I already turned up the code font. It looks kind of small though. I'll make it a little bit bigger. Okay, there we go. Okay, so this is my script. Um, and if I click on scripts, you can see that global.gd here. And the point of this script is to keep track of a bunch of different values that I'm gonna use throughout my game. And uh, the reason I have to do this, so we only have one scene right now, but eventually our game is gonna have like multiple levels and stuff. And so if we can imagine, let me get my uh, my drawing thing. Uh-oh, I can't erase. Uh-oh. OK, there we go. OK. For some reason, my tablet is not working. Let me just choose the pencil and let's see. Oh, weird. OK, my tablet's not working. Let me just unplug it real quick, see if it works. No. Huh. I can see. Okay. For some reason the button's not clicking. Can I click on other stuff? Can. I guess it's just this application. Um, let me quit the application and try it again. Sorry about this.
Okay, there we go. Okay, I don't know what's happening, but now it seems to work. Um, so let's grab the pencil, move this over here. Okay, so if we have a bunch of different scenes, like the, say this is level one, this is level two, but I have a player scene that's gonna be you know, in both of these levels. And I also have things like how many lives does the player have and how many points does the player have. And so that's what I need to save in my global script is things that are gonna need, be needed in more than one scene. So I have like lives and points, uh, just for example, anything that you might wanna have like other inventory items. So each one of these scenes can reference these values, but when we move from different scenes, we're not gonna lose the values. So that's why we need to have a global script. Um, so we're gonna start with that. And so one thing that we're gonna see here um, is a couple things that, you know, if you've never written code before, this isn't gonna make any sense, but this extends basically means that this program, this script is gonna use a bunch of code that is already built into Godot. And that code is organized in this thing called a node. Um, and a node, we have all these nodes that we were creating in our scene. Just remember that's our building block. So everything in Godot is basically a node. And to create scenes and different components, we fit the nodes together. Um, one thing that is really nice about the way that the Godot code editor is set up is if I right click on any of these words, um, it's gonna say look up symbol. And so the reference or the documentation for the programming language is actually built into the editor. So if I click look up symbol, it's gonna bring me to this window that actually explains what this does. And so this is gonna look super confusing if you've never written code before. Um, and we don't really have to worry about what this is. We'll look at it more, but this basically tells me what a node is and what I can do with it. And it has the properties and the methods and so these are the ways that this tells me what I can do with this um, piece of code. And typically you're gonna learn code from you know, me or watching a video online or something like that. But when, before those things exist and you wanna learn how to use something, if, you know, if somebody hasn't gone over how to do it, this is how you would do it. You would read through the documentation and say, okay, if I wanna you know, make a character, I have to do this and find this, you know, this, uh, method and stuff like that. So it's really convenient to have this here. It's probably kind of confusing looking if you haven't written code before, so we're not gonna to spend too much time here. Um, but just keep that in mind. You can always right click and look at the description for anything um, in your code. So I'm gonna close this. So I'm just gonna to go to file and close and go back to our global script. Um, so one thing that you will use in code that's not actually code is something called comments. And when I want to write a comment in Godot script, I use a hashtag. And anything I write after this hashtag is going to be a comment. So the code editor actually ignores it. And it's a way for me to take notes. So code looks kind of weird and it doesn't always make that much sense. And so I need to explain, you know, what it's used, being used for. So I'm going to say this are, these are some global values um, to track uh, player metrics so metrics are just things like the number of lives you know the number of items different things like that um, so then we're gonna make some of those values and the thing that we're gonna use to save these values is called a variable and the way that i create a variable is i just write var and then i write the name of the variable um, so VAR stands for variable. I wanna track the player lives. So I'm gonna say player underscore lives, and I'm gonna set it equal to three. So our player will start out with three lives. Um, a variable, <coughs> excuse me, uh, just as a quick explanation, um, let me do another drawing. Just gonna erase all this. Okay. And let's get a skinnier pencil. How do I do that? Okay. Um, and let's get a different color. Let's get pink. Okay. So on your computer, there you have something called memory. Okay. And it looks like a big, crazy, gigantic uh, matrix or grid or whatever you want to call it. So let's imagine this is your memory on your computer. 
And the memory is really important because it remembers things like your username or you know how many lives you have left, all these different things. And if we want to use the memory, one way that we can do that is by assigning a variable. So we can take this little part of memory here and say, call this player lives. Okay, and then we can put our number three into that little chunk of memory on our computer. And so that way, whenever we say, what's our player lives, it's gonna tell us it's three. Or if we say, actually, you know, we want player lives to be two now because our player ran into a cactus or something, then this chunk of memory will turn into a two. Uh, and then we can use that when, you know, eventually it'll turn into a one and a zero and our player will die. And then we'll start over at three again. So that's a really simple example of how a variable works. It's essentially giving a name to a piece of memory and then assigning a value to that memory that we can get later and we can manipulate in our code. Um, so that's a simple ex explanation. Uh, it gets a little more complicated, but um, that's good enough for now. So my variable player lives. So one thing that you'll probably notice is I use an underscore here because my variable name can't have any spaces in it. I can't do that. That's going to give me an error. You can see it turns red. That's another nice thing with the Godot editor is if I have an error in my code, it's going to turn the line of code red. And you can see what the error is down here. It actually says, expected end of statement var got identifier lives instead. Um, and so it was expecting me to say variable player equals something, but instead I just said lives. And that's like a totally different variable since there's a space there. So it's confused about why I'm doing that. So in Godot script, the way that I make a variable with two words in it is just by putting an underscore here. Um, different languages do it differently, but that's how Godot script does it. So that's what we'll stick with in the class. The next part of this statement is the equal sign. And this is a little bit more confusing than it might at first seem. Um, do another little drawing. It's gotta be an easier way to erase, but I haven't figured it out yet. Uh, so in math, if I say x equals three, that means that x and three are the same thing. So x is three. In programming, it's a little bit different. And we have a different way of expressing this that we'll get to uh, in a later uh, example. But when I use equals in programming, what I'm really saying is that the, num the name x has the value three. So if x is our little memory bucket, three is what's inside of it. And that can change. x doesn't have to stay three and player lives doesn't have to stay three. x is really pointing to this little memory bucket and then we put the value three inside of it by using the equal sign. And so when I say equals, or when I, when I use equals with programming, a lot of the time, uh, instead of saying equals, I'll say gets or assigned. Um, so three is assigned to the variable player lives. Um, all right, so I'm gonna write some more variables. Um, any questions so far? All right, well, let me know if anything is confusing or if you have any questions. So let's write another variable. So another thing that we are going to want to know is how many total lives can the player have? Um, so I'm going to say total lives. And this is also going to be three. So this is in case if our player gets down to zero and we need to reset their lives, we can reference this. And so we can change that if we want the player to have four lives or something like that. But um, that's a pretty simple value, and it's going to be the same at the start. Um, another thing that we might want to have in here is a number of points or items that the player has collected. So for my examples, I'm just going to use a really simple item. And so I'm going to use the variable item underscore count. And this is going to start at zero. And so this is going to be like, how many items do we collect? Um, so I'm going to say, keep track of collecting items. And you can have different types of items. Um, so you might want to say, uh, you know, like coin count or uh, what else could you collect? Like star count or something like that. I'm just going to use item just as a generic for now, but I might change it later. Um, and I think that's actually enough to get started. So this will be good enough for our global script. Let's check the notes and make sure I didn't miss anything. Oh, I didn't explain what comments are. Uh, 
and say this is a comment. It is ignored by Godot. Okay. Uh, and yeah, I got everything else. Okay. So with our global script, it's not attached to anything in our scene. So the one thing that we have to do with our global script is we have to attach it um, to our whole game. And the way that we do that is I go to project and go to project settings. And then there's a tab auto load where I can add scripts that are added to the whole game instead of an individual scene. Um, so I can just choose the script here. So I click on the folder, go to open a file and choose global. And I'm gonna click open. And then I just have to click add. And it's gonna give a name. I can change this if I want, but that's how I'm gonna reference it in my other script. So I may not need to do that today, but eventually I'll have to remember that this is called global and I can reference it using this name here. Okay, so that's my global script. So next we'll get into our player controller. Um, any questions before I get started with the player controller? All right. So our player controller is gonna do a lot of things eventually. Um, we're gonna go over a couple of basic things first, and then we'll see how much we can add. Uh, and then we're also gonna be adding a lot to it throughout the semester to make it more complex. Um, but for now, let's just get started. Um, so I already have my player controller simple, um, but we're just gonna start from scratch. So I'm gonna close this. And I'm gonna go to my player scene. So I choose, I clicked on my player node in the scene view, and I'm gonna click on this little scene icon. That opens up my player scene. And then if I go down to the right in the inspector where the script is, I'm gonna undo the script there. So I'm gonna re remove that script. Um, oh, and I forgot that I added two collisions. Let's delete this. So if I wanna add a script to an object, I can go to the script tag and do it that way, but I can also add it here. So the last element in my inspector is the script. I can click on the empty and click new script. And it's gonna fill in player because that's the name of the scene. Um, I want it to be called player controller. Uh, so I'm gonna change this to player controller. It doesn't really matter that much what you call it, to be honest, but um, I would just like to be specific. So then I want to save this in my scripts folder. So I can go back. I can use my recent uh, window here, or I can go back and go into scripts and save this. And so this says it inherits from a kinematic body 2D, which is good because that's what my player is. And I'm going to go with an empty template and I'm going to click create. Okay, so now we see something pretty similar. Oh, I brought up my player controller symbol again. Let's close that. So we see something similar to our global script. We see that extends, which means we get all the code that's inside a kinematic body 2D. But the kinematic body 2D is, def not, is different from a node. So let's take a look at that. So I'm going to right click and go to the symbol. And so you can see the kinematic body 2D actually has all these other parts of code in them. Um, so it has the code for a collision object, for a node, for a canvas item, and then node is all the way back here. And so it has all the code from all of these different objects, which is really nice um, for us. And then it has its own sort of like properties and methods. So we can see things like uh, things that we're gonna use like move and collide. So it has a built-in function to move the player. So we need, that's what the kinematic body 2D has is these built-in functions that we can use in our own script. Um, so that's going to be very useful. Okay, so I'm going to close this. And so let's get started writing our scripts. So let's see. So uh, this is going to control our player movement. And it also sets the animations. So set player animations as well. So we're going to start our script with some variables. And we're gonna use a different type of variable that we haven't talked about quite yet. Um, and so this is called an export variable. So I'm gonna start with a new keyword export and then our variable VAR and then the word speed. And I'm gonna 
assign this variable a number 100. And what this export does is it reveals my variable to my editor. And I can show you what that looks like if I go back to the 2D scene and click on my player. Now, at the very top of my inspector, you see the script variables. So speed is equal to 100. And that's really useful because as a coder, I can add stuff into my scene that somebody who's not going to write the code can, can adjust. So if I'm working with a game designer and I have this speed variable and my game designer is like, this is too slow, I'm going to crank up the speed to 200. They can do that without ever opening the script. So that's one way that it makes it really easy to collaborate with Godot between developers and designers. The other thing that this is useful for is I might have different scenes where my player has different speeds. And so if I put my player in a different scene here, I can change the speed variable in different scenes and each one will work differently. So there's a couple good use cases for this export variable. Um, so I'm going to say these are uh, editable uh, or let's say uh, variables that can be edited in Godot. So the other type of variable we have are called member variables. And these are variables that are only part of our script. So member variables. And I think we need a couple of these. Yeah. Uh, so we need one for if our player is still alive. So variable is underscore alive. And this is gonna be a different type of data. I'm gonna call this true. Okay, so we have different types of data and we'll talk a little bit more about those um, as we go through these programming lessons, but we've seen a couple of them so far. So let's talk about um, what they are. Uh, so let me get my little drawing tool. Okay. So we have a few basic types of data. Uh, one is a number. And a number is anything like a, you know, a number, one, zero, 100. It's a numerical value that we can use to represent things like the speed of a character or the size of a character or the damage that a character might do or the number of lives a character has. You know, it's, it's pretty basic, it's just numbers. And we can do a lot of things with those numbers. We will um, continue doing stuff with the numbers. Another type of data is called a Boolean. This is something you may not, this is probably a term you may not be familiar with, but Boolean just means true or false. And so a Boolean value is used for things that we want to make decisions about. Um, so for example, uh, let's imagine you were making a game uh, of like a tennis video game and you had like a tennis racket and let's say, you know, here's your tennis racket. And let's say you have a little collider. Um, let me, actually, I'll switch to a color, but let's say here's our tennis ball, right? And the tennis ball is kind of moving towards the tennis racket. And let's say you have a collider around your tennis racket and you have a collider on, around your tennis ball. At some point in the program, your user is gonna like hit the A button or the X button or whatever. And you're gonna ask, is this collider overlapping with this collider and if the answer is yes that'll be true if the answer is no that'll be false and then based on which one it is we're going to make a decision to either you know send the tennis ball back there or the tennis ball is going to go past the player and you're going to you know lose a point or something like that so in computers we have to make a lot of decisions and the way that we express those decisions is either as true or false that it's either yes or no um, and so a Boolean value is, uh, you know, just a very simple value. It can only be true or false. Okay, so we're going to add another variable, which is a more, even more complicated value, and that's our velocity. And our velocity is something called a vector two. Um, and this has parentheses at the end because it's a more complicated. It's not just a number or a Boolean. It's actually a, its own object. So it's kind of like our player where it has its own variables and functions and stuff like that. If we go to the symbol, you can see it's a vector used to do 2D math. It has an X and a Y, and it also has a bunch of functions that go along with it. This is kind of complicated, um, but the reason we use vectors uh, when we're doing calculations is to make our calculations more simple. So uh, one more quick drawing. 
I know this is probably like a lot of information for, you know, an intro programming lesson. Uh, but with programming, one of the things that's kind of tricky is it's hard to do anything without doing a bunch of things at the same time. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a little, it's a little tricky, but hopefully, you know, we'll cover all this stuff and review this stuff again. So for our vector two, imagine we have our player he's sitting right here, uh, and we want to move the player, you know, over here, or maybe we even want to move the player, um, over here and then up a little bit. So the player's position is going to be expressed as an x, y value. It's two numbers, our horizontal space and our vertical space. And so is our velocity. So if we want to move our player all the way here, we have to move both on the x axis and on the y axis. Um, but we're moving at different rates, right? If we're going from, you know, here to here, we're going like this much each time. This much on X is a lot, right? Let's imagine this is like two. And this much on Y is less. Let's imagine that's like one. So we can express this number, this direction as a vector. So that's two, one. Um, so a vector is basically just two numbers, but it makes it really easy for us to do math. We can add vectors, we can multiply vectors. So instead of having to multiply the X and the Y separately, we can just do it with one value. So they're kind of complicated, but they help us a lot with our code. And we'll talk about this more as we add in more stuff. Okay, so those are our variables. Now we're gonna get into functions, which is a whole other programming concept. Um, so let's pause for a second. Uh, any questions um, on our variables so far? All right. If there's no questions, that means either you're completely lost or I'm doing an amazing job. Um, so I'm just gonna- Makes sense so far. Okay, great. Uh, I'm just gonna keep going. So we've got our variables, now we have to get into functions. And that's even another kind of complicated uh, subject, but basically a function in programming is something that we can reuse. So with programming, we have data and we capture that data in our variables, but then we also have things that we wanna do. We wanna move the player, we wanna update the player, and that's usually like a series of steps. And we capture that series of steps using a function. And typically we wanna do it more than once, like we are gonna to wanna to move, move again, move again, move again. So we need to be able to call that function multiple times. So Godot has some built-in functions that we can use. And the first one we're gonna use is our physics update. And this is just tied to the internal uh, rendering clock in Godot. So that's really nice because it's gonna make our physics match our scene. So the way that I get this is I just type the word func. This is a shortcut for the word function. And then all of our Godot built-in functions start with a little underscore. So if I put an underscore here, it's actually gonna show me all of the options for the different built-in functions. And the one that I wanna use is called physics process. So I can find that, I can type it out, but I can also just find it and hit enter. And it's gonna put that function right there for me. So a couple of things that are different than a, with a function than the rest of our code. Uh, let's take a look. So with a function, it's sort of like a variable. Instead of var, we have func, but it's the, kind of the same thing. It's just saying we want to create this function. Then we don't have to start with an underscore. That's a Godot thing, but we also have a similar naming process. So we have two names or two words in our name. So we have to use an underscore in between those words. Um, and then the thing that makes a function different is we have a couple of parentheses at the end and that's because we can put different things inside of a function to make it behave differently. And the thing that's in here, this thing called delta, this is the change in time. Okay, so the reason we wanna know this when it comes to games, most games are trying to run 60 frames per second. Maybe they're trying to run faster, um, but that's pretty fast. And our computer, usually it, it can, it'll, it'll be fine, it'll be doing that. But if something takes a little longer to process or a specific frame has a lot of detail in it, it might take a little longer, but it also might take a little less time. 
it you know there, it might be like fractions of a millisecond difference so uh 60 frames per second is uh i forget let's google it real quick um so 60 frames per second is uh let's see 60 times 60 uh is 300 wait how do i do this i'm just gonna do 1000 divided by 60. i forget if that's right but yeah i think that's right uh yeah because that's how many milliseconds are in a second divided by 60. so that's how many milliseconds okay so 16 milliseconds so a really really tiny amount of time is what delta stands for so it might be exactly 16 milliseconds it might be like 16.5 it might be you know 16.75 it's never going to be exactly perfect because our computer is never going to be running like exactly perfectly so in order for our movement not to look weird and choppy we're going to multiply the movement times the amount of time in between our frames so even though it's a really really tiny amount of time it's going to make a noticeable difference in our character's movement so there's going to be other things that we're going to get inside of functions but uh, our delta is the basic thing that we get with our physics process the next thing that you'll notice with our function is that it opens a new block in our code and different programs deal with this differently but you can see it here there's a little colon anytime you see a colon in godot script you'll see it'll indent over one tab for you so you see how it moved my cursor over here so by indenting over one tab we know that we're still inside of this function once we go out of that then we're leaving the function so that's a little bit tricky but you'll see how it looks as i start to write more code so by default, Godot is going to move me over one tab. And I'm going to start uh, my physics process. OK, so the first thing I'm actually going to do here is I'm going to ask if my player is still alive. And this is another uh, thing called a conditional statement. So I'll put a note here, conditional statement. This is just asking a question. If something is true, we want to do something. If it's not, then we don't. So the way that we do this, if we say if, so if is, a, is another keyword, you can see it's pink. So it's a little bit different than var or func. We're not creating some new data. We're asking a question. So we're going to say if is alive. And so if our player is still alive, we want to move our player. So after an if statement, I'm going to put a colon. And that opens up a whole new block of code. So just like with our function, once we have this colon, we have to indent a little bit. And everything that happens here is only going to happen if the is alive is true. Then when we go back, we're going to be outside of that code block. Um, so again, it's a bit confusing, but you'll get used to it as I write more code. So if we're alive, what we want to do is update our, our character. So I'm actually going to create a separate function to deal with this. So my code is a little bit more organized. So I'm going to say update movement. And I'm going to pass this uh, delta value to the player. Um, let me check my script for a second. Oh, I called it player update. That's OK. It doesn't really matter that much what we call it. Um, so I'm going to do update movement. Uh, and then I didn't do this in my script here, but I should actually do this separately. So I'm going to say update animation. Um, and I don't need the delta for this. So I'm actually going to create these functions to kind of organize my code. Um, and so I'm actually done with my physics process now. So I can leave the if block by going back one, and I can leave the function by going back again. Uh, and I'm going to hit enter again to go down another space. Um, and I'm getting a red line here because this update movement function doesn't exist. That's what we're about to create. So this first function, physics process, Godot invented that for us, so we can just use it. But our update movement function, we're going to actually make our own function to update our player movement. So to do this, I'm going to say func again. Um, it's another new function. And I'm going to call this update movement. I'm not going to use an underscore because this is my own function. 
So I don't want to confuse it with a Godot function. And I'm going to use the same delta. So I'm just passing the delta, that change in time, from here to here to here. And so now I'm actually going to write my player update. So um, what I want to do here is basically capture the user input and then move my player based on that user input. Um, so I'm going to start by just putting a comment. So I'm going to say, um, well, actually, to start, let me check my script. OK, so with this particular script, the very first thing that I want to do is reset my player's velocity, because I don't want my player to be sliding around in this particular script. We may do that later when we add in some, some more physics. So first, I'm going to say reset the player velocity. And now I'm going to say velocity.x. So the movement on the x axis is equal to 0. And velocity.y is also equal to 0. So this makes my player stop whenever you know, they're moving if, I, if, if the next frame comes. So I'm not going to be like sliding in between frames. So now I want to capture the user input. So capture user input. I'm going to put a few lines here so we have some more space. And we have another error here because we didn't create this function yet. Um, so actually, I'll just comment this out for now so I don't get this distracting uh, red line. So I'll just put a comment there and keep going. So I want to capture the user input. And I basically want to say, uh, if the uh, player is hitting a certain key, then I want to move the player in that direction. Um, so I'm going to use another if statement here. So I have if first. And now I can use a built-in Godot function to capture whether or not the player is hitting a key. And that is all co captured inside of this input uh, variable. So if I type in input and then a dot, it gives me a lot of suggestions um, for what I can look for. Uh, and if we right click on input and go to look up sy symbol, we can see all of the different stuff that we can get here. So we want to do uh, get action pressed. Um, so we have is action just pressed, is action pressed. That's what we want to know. Um, so let's close this. And just to quickly remember where this is coming from, uh, we set this up when we did our Godot intro in the input map. These are our actions. And so we're looking to see, are these different buttons that we set up press? So that way we don't have to have the keys hard-coded into our script. We can change the keys in our input map and it'll still the script will still work the same way. So let's start with our write input. So I'm gonna say input dot uh, is action pressed. And there's a few different versions of this. We're gonna start with the basic is action pressed. And you can see it's going to fill in the possible actions that I already created. So I have move right. So I'm going to start with that one. And if you don't see that, that means you need to fill in the input map. That's OK. Um, you can go back to the Godot intro, and it'll, I'll, it talks about how to do that. Or if you're not sure, you can ask me, and we can go over it. So I say if input that is action pressed move right and then this is another if statement so i need a colon at the end so i'm opening a new code block again and so if that's the case what i want to do is change my velocity dot x so i'm going to say velocity dot x and equals speed so remember we have this speed value with this default 100 and so we're just going to say that our x value is equal to 100. So that's going to move our player uh, in the scene. Um, and this, doesn't, this isn't quite going to do it. If I play my scene now, you'll see I'm hitting the right arrow key and nothing happens. So there's one more thing that I have to add here. I have to actually use this velocity. So this is where I'm going to use one of my built-in kinematic body functions. I'm going to say... Uh, move and slide. And then it tells me, one of the nice things about Godot is it actually shows me what I need here. This is a bit confusing, um, so I'll just explain what it is. But if it doesn't make sense, that's OK. I'm just going to put in my new velocity. 
as my first input. And then it needs to know which direction is up in order to know how to move my player. And there's an easy way to do that. I can just say vector two dot up, capital U, capital P. So now you'll see my player is actually gonna move. So if I hit the right arrow key, I'm moving to the right. So that's a pretty exciting. Uh, we're getting kind of close to the end of class. So let's just finish this up uh, and then uh, we'll do the rest in on Thursday. Okay, so I wanna add my left movement. So I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna say if input dot is action pressed. And this time I'm gonna say move left. And so now I'm going to do the opposite of this, right? I just want to say velocity dot x equals negative speed. So the movement in the horizontal space is negative, whatever our speed value is. So now I should be able to move left and right. OK, so that's pretty cool. And so then you probably can already guess what the other inputs are, so I'm going to just Add them in here if input dot is action pressed and for this one i'm going to say move uh down so if i want to move down i'm now working with my velocity dot y that's equal to speed and same thing with uh my move up Except now I'm going with y negative is up, so the velocity dot y equals negative speed. And that should actually be everything that I need to do with my movement. So let's take a look. Pretty good. So I can move right and left. I can move up and down. So that's great. So we can move our character around in the, in the screen, but we don't have the animations yet. Uh, let me double check. Yeah, OK. Um, so let's leave that. We only have 10 minutes left, so let's leave that for Thursday. So I'll pick up here uh, on Thursday, and I'll also do some documentation. So that'll take more than 10 minutes. Um, so I'm going to pause.